Hello, everyone. This is Becky Degroski with TrueCode. I am the product manager here at TrueCode, and I will be your presenter today. I apologize. We had a little bit of a snafu. I couldn't get the meeting to start. That's the way it always works, isn't it? Technology is great when it works. So let's not waste any more time. Let's look at the agenda. We're going to talk about the update process for um, both the DRGs and the codes. We're going to talk just a little bit about the quality reporting program, only because it does impact our reimbursement. Um, we're going to talk about some codes and some DRG changes and the payment impact. And the payment impact won't be separate. It'll be all included as we're talking about the changes. And of course, that impact is with the ICD-10 CMPCS grouper. And then any questions, we'll have hopefully time at the end. If you do have questions during the presentation, I want to encourage you to um, put them in the chat and let's just take a look at how that can work. First off, you should have a control panel next to, it should be on the right side of your screen and it should have a little orange arrow, like that arrow is pointing on the um, slide. If you click that, it'll minimize it over to the side of the screen so that you can have a full screen view of the presentation. And then you can also open that and underneath the box that says questions, please feel free to enter any questions in there. And Meg DeVoe is my facilitator today. She's on the um, uh, conference with us and she will be answering any questions or queuing them up for me. And Meg, please feel free to interrupt at any point if you um, have a question or if there's a problem and you need me to stop the presentation, I'll be happy to do it. Okay, you got it. So, great, thank you. So with that being said, let's talk about the update process. The codes for ICD-10 are updated every year, possibly, um, twice a year in October and in April. And April was added uh, several years ago um, because we had some new codes that for things like the um, uh, SARS virus and we had some changes to the disposition discharge status that impacts the DRGs and they happened mid-year so we had a grouper change in the middle of the year. Um, for codes to happen in April, they have to be pretty significant. And I frankly can't remember any other than the virus that happened. Um, most of the time, everything happens in October because October is the federal fiscal year. It's the beginning of the fiscal year. This year, we have 3,922 new codes, 2,047 revised codes, and 788 deleted codes. That sounds like a huge number, and it really is a huge number. Um, however, because of the laterality in ICD-10, um, one change could impact a whole lot of codes for left, right, bilateral, and others. So there's four codes right there. So it's a lot, but it's exponential, a lot. And with the deleted codes, sometimes codes are marked as deleted, but in reality, the code is maybe at the three-digit category in, in ICD-10 PC or CM. It's at the three-digit category, and maybe they've expanded the code. So that three-digit code is no longer valid because you have to use all four, five, six, or seven digits. Um, so it sounds like a lot, but it's not as great. At the end of today's presentation, on the last slide, I have links to websites that are pretty cool that um, you can go get everything that we're going to talk about today. You can go download all the codes. You can go look at it, slice it and dice it as much as you want. Um, so who makes the code changes? That is done by Coordination and Maintenance Committee. And they last met in um, September 13th and 14th of 2016, so a year ago. And the decisions that they made following that meeting, because they don't make any decisions during the meeting, that's where the codes that we're changing this October have come from. They also meet in March, so on March 7th and 8th of 2017. There were no codes that were changed that are being um, implemented 
for October during that March call. Now you'll notice right now they're meeting. So they're meeting today and tomorrow. And the meeting is, the Coordination and Maintenance Committee is made up of representatives from the American Hospital Association, the American Health Information Management Association, uh, CMS, and the National Center of Vital Statistics. Now obviously the two official folks there are CMS, and CMS is responsible for all of the procedure codes. They're the ones who will publish the procedure codes. They do all the PCS codes, come from CMS. And National Center of Health Statistics, Vital Statistics, they are the CM part of, they're the diagnosis codes. And the reason that that is, is because National Center of Vital Health Statistics is part of the CDC, which is the World Health designated representative in our hemisphere. So they are responsible for ICD-10, ICD-11. They're responsible for the ICD at the international level. And the one thing you want to remember about ICD is that it's diagnoses only. There are never procedures, there have never been procedures as part of the ICD, and that's why we have CM and PCS. I have maintained that PCS is here to stay. It'll be living it with us when we're in ICD. 12, you know, when we're beyond the beyond, because it's not linked to the CM parts of the code. Okay. Um, the quality reporting is our next uh, agenda item. And the first part of that are the hacks. And the hacks are the hospital acquired conditions. And so there's a whole group of categories for hospital acquired positions. And what really makes the change and the impact is that we use that present on admission logic. So anything that is a, identified as something that's occurred during the hospitalization, you have to use the POA of no, this was not present on admission. Um, these only apply to short-term hospitals. And when you use it, and this is only on the secondary diagnoses, because obviously based on default and based on definition, the principal diagnoses it doesn't get impacted with a yes or a no, what did you come in with it? By definition, you should have come in with it. Um, but you're gonna get two DRGs, the initial DRG, which looks at all the codes, and then the final DRG, which eliminates any codes that are hacked that have the no. Um, the final DRG is then the payable DRG. And remember that the only time that the initial DRG is different from the final DRG is if that hack, and they are, of course, by definition, always a comorbid condition or a major comorbid condition because why else? How else is it going to impact the DRG? Um, if that's your only CC or MCC on the, on the encounter. And truthfully, as we all know, in most cases, the people that acquire problems after they're in the hospital or people that are already pretty sick and have a lot of other conditions. And that's the reason that across the timeline, there's been a very minimum number. I think it's something like 0.01% of the total Medicare population that have really had their DRGs impacted by the hospital acquired conditions in the POA. And this process has not changed since it was implemented implemented and it was implemented a while back with when we were still using ICD-9 which doesn't that seem like forever ago. Um, moving forward here the hospital value-based purchasing is also something that impacts the reimbursement. Um, unlike the hack the value-based purchasing does not impact the DRG assigned. What it does is it determines whether the facility is paying an incentive payment in addition to the DRG payment where the hack is a penalty reduction. So if you fall within the hack at the lower 25 percentile of people who, of facilities that have hacks, so you have more than, than the top 75 percentile, you're gonna get a reduction in your payment. With the value-based purchasing, that comes separately. It's an award, so to speak. And it's, it's giving you a, um, an incentive if you've 
provided quality care as judged by the hospital quality reporting system. And that's where it comes into all the measures and the core measures. And we're not going to go into all that today because that could be a whole program all by itself on how that's all calculated. I just wanted to mention it because when you're talking about DRGs, it's not 100% about the codes like it used to be. So here's how the codes are divided up. The majority of the changes, as you, as you can see, are in the PCS side of the house with the minimal on the, well, I don't want to say minimal, 454 new codes is not minimal, but with a lesser um, in the diagnosis area. And I think part of that is because the procedures have always been where we've had a lot of changes because we have new things. And really, with anatomy, um, we don't have a lot of, of new diagnoses, although we do, but it's not. Now, we know, pretty much know anatomy. We don't know physiology as well, but we know the anatomy. Um, I want to give you just a couple examples of some of the codes that have changed. So in the CM, we have uh, new codes that's been expanded under the um, CDIF to identify recurrence from not specified as recurrence. So these are new codes um, at the AO 4.7 category. And this is an example of AO 4.7 was a code before for enterocolitis due to C. diff, but now it's been expanded. So it counts kind of as a deleted code, which doesn't make sense because it's still there, but it, it's no longer a valid code. Um, but that's a good thing because C. diff is a big deal for people. It's one of those things on my list I don't want. Um, and it's important to know the difference between if it's recurrent or not recurrent because of the drugs that, that are um, given to the patient to treat it. That another nice change, we didn't have ketoacidosis with type 2 diabetes. We weren't able to code it. So they've added the whole section E11.1, and it's divided um, with ketoacidosis without a coma and with ketoacidosis with a coma or type 2 diabetes. And that's pretty nice. Uh, it's only taking them a couple years. It's going to take a while for all the oddness to get shaken out of ICD-10. That's what I say. Um, until we get like normal state of, of code stability. This year, we also have had a lot of uh, new codes for myocardial infarction. And I've just given the example here, I21.A1 for a type 2 myocardial infarction and I21.A9 for other myocardial infarction. Um, these are the kind of things that when you see these codes and you see the specificity that's being added, these are the things that our um, clinical documentation improvement people need to be aware of so we can get the physicians to start documenting so we can get the codes in the right codes. Um, we also have many new codes for non-pressure ulcers. I've just given you a couple of them here. So we have L97.805, non-pressure chronic ulcer of other part of unspecified lower leg with muscle involvement without evidence of necrosis. And that's a mouthful, and I tried to figure out what would be my other unspecified part of my leg. But, you know, it, it's whatever's not specified in the other codes. Um, I'm going to drop down to the last code here on the list. There were many codes added in the substance abuse categories to identify in remission. This is just one of them, F10.11, alcohol abuse in remission. And I think that's wonderful. That's a good classification. That's a good thing for people to start following with people in recovery. Um, and finally, I like this. I had to add it because I thought it was pretty funny. We had some deleted codes, and it was only at the seventh character. In this case, the SO6.1X, that X is my X, and it, it identifies all the codes that are in that SO6.1 code range, but SO6.1 whatever 7D for subsequent encounter has been deleted, and if you look at the code, Traumatic cerebral edema with loss of consciousness of any duration with death due to brain injury. Just give it a second and you'll get it. 
I think that um, this is a good one for the folks who are enamored with all those odd external cause codes. Um, and you can see the one below it is the same thing. We're having sequela in somebody who has suffered brain injury and death. I don't know how that could be. Um, in PCS, we have a couple of changes that were made. And again, when a change is made, it can be across multiple tables and it will impact multiple codes. And that's why it's exponential. It looks like a whole lot of numbers. But here's an example. A new six character in the device column of Y was added to identify other device. And this example is in the table O2H. Um, and in that same table, we have a seventh character, a new one that's a qualifier for J to identify interoperative. And we have a device value of R that revised external heart assist to short term external heart assist. So they've given us a way to identify interoperative uh, balloon assist for things that have been discussed and debated and you get three coders in the room, you get three different answers of how you should code it, but they've led us to do a better code for that. Um, I find it interesting that when PCS was first established, there was never gonna be any other because they didn't feel, they felt that it would be specific enough. We didn't need any codes for other, but I think in the short time we've been using it, it's been identified that yes, we do because until something can be absolutely coded to the specificity that's provided, there are times when we're gonna need others. So I was happy to see that they added that other. Um, the other change that I was really happy to see is um, in table 10D, that we have a new seventh character qualifier for nine for manual, which now gives us a code for manual removal of placenta. And the body parts can be both just the manual removal of retained or retained or delayed or, you know, there's three options there. So this was another really, really good change to the system. And you can see the changes were logical. Again, I've given you at the end of this presentation the links to all the codes so you can go out and take a look and look at all the new codes. So let's talk now about DRG changes. Um, for this fiscal year, 2017 to 2018, we're up to version 35 of the DRG grouper, um, which is a little scary for someone like me who remembers just, I was gonna leave before version one ever even was implemented, I was gonna leave the coding business, and yet here I still am. Um, this year we have 754 DRGs. We had um, three DRGs uh, were deleted. There were no new DRGs created. There's lots of logic changes and DRG title changes to correspond with those logic changes. This includes DRGs 998 and 999, which are the air DRGs. If you ha ever have either of these two DRGs assigned, there's a data problem. The these are, are never assigned based on codes. There's something wrong going into the grouper. And of course, the highest number is still 999. We only have 754 because when we went to version uh, 25, which was the MSDRGs, the folks at CMS wise in their ways from using DRGs all these years, they left spaces in between the MDC so that as things grew and changed, they could add codes within the MDC. Um, let's just review the DRG logic. It's always remember based on the assignment of principal diagnosis. Principal diagnosis is key because that determines which major diagnostic category, which MDC that the, that the um, DRG comes from. And it is then divided by, did you have a procedure or didn't you have a procedure? And then it's further divided under each of those trees. Was there a CC, was there an MCC, or was there neither um, to get to your DRG? In all things, there's exceptions. and there are 15 exceptions to the principal diagnoses rule. And these are the pre-MDC. These are all the um, DRGs that are not within an MDC. And these are the transplants, the traits, and the ECMO that are included here. Okay, um, we're gonna go through 
DRG changes, there's a lot, a lot of them. So as it gets to be too much, we might skip through some and just hit the most interesting of them. But in MDC1, which is the diseases and disorder of the nervous system, code R53.2, which is functional quadriplegia, has been reassigned from the DRGs for spinal disorders and injuries to the DRGs um, 947 and 948 for signs and symptoms. And when I have listed the DRGs with a single title like that, and I'll have with, without, CCMCC, that's what that means. The first one is with it, the second one is without it. Um, so that's how you can interpret them. Uh, we used to call them back in the day when there were only two pivot pairs. Now there's triplets sometimes. Um, this change was made as a request from a commenter, and the commenter stated that functional quadriplegia does not involve spinal injuries, so that they felt this was completely um, misclassified from the beginning. And CMS looks at, when, when a requester asks them to look at something, they look at it, and they have a really clear process that they go through, and they examine the code within the DRGs, where they are, they examine where they think they should be, they look at the length of stay, they look at the reimbursement for those um, DRGs with that code. And in this case, they had their clinical advisors review and they agreed this, uh, you know, this shouldn't be. It's a symptom because it could be a result of a variety of conditions and it doesn't belong with spinal disorders and injuries. So this was, uh, it was removed. Now what this does for, uh, for that code, if it's your principal diagnosis, as far as your weights are concerned, the weights do go down, but a nudge, so that it goes from 52 and 53 are 1.5386 and 0.9514 respectively, and it goes down to 1.17445 and 0.7711 respectively for DRGs 947 and 949. Eight. So there's a, there's a little bit of a, of a difference there, downward difference. Um, staying within MDC-1, reassigned all the cases with the principal diagnosis of epilepsy with an implant of a neurostimulator to a newly titled DRG-23. And what happened was they changed the DRG title from craniotomy with major device, blah, 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 to craniotomy with major device, blah, 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 or epilepsy with neurostimulator. So they've just added those epilepsy cases right here. Uh, this change was also a result of a request. Uh, the list of ep epilepsy codes can be found in the Federal Register if you have the PDF for the final rule, pages 29 to 30. If you don't have the, the um, final rule in PDF, if you have the, the um, full Federal Register, then it's page numbers uh, 38018 through 38019. And just to give you a start on the codes, O-N-H-O-O-N-Z. I swear I need my decoder ring for PCS codes. That's one of the codes for the... Uh, for the, the neurostimulator. Okay, let's move along. Still in DR, MDC1, we um, renamed DRG 61, 62, and 63, and they renamed them from acute ischemic stroke with use of thrombolytic agent to ischemic stroke, precerebral occlusion, or transient ischemia with thrombolytic agents. And what they did was they took all the diagnoses that are currently assigned to DRG 67 and 68 and 69, and they added them to the new renamed DRGs if the patient is given thrombolytic agents. And the reason for this is they felt that, and I hate to say this because it really irritates me when they put it in print, that people were not coding the diagnoses completely accurately 100%. 
I hate when they say that because yes, we are. But they also felt that it was very important to get everybody who is getting a thrombolytic agent to be within the same DRG so they could see how the um, care was rendered and they could also, they're getting like resources. So they should be reimbursed at the same level. We're gonna move to MDC2. And um, this is our disorders of the eye. And they've moved T49.5X1A and its Goombas poisoning by ophthalmic drugs and preparations from DRGs 124 and 125 for disorders of the eye to DRGs 917 and 918 for poisoning because, and this again, this was a request, and if a patient, patient swallows eye drops, so they're poisoned by an ophthalmic drug, that's not an eye disorder, that's a poisoning. So it should be classified to the poisoning. And CMS looked at it and said, yeah, duh, and they made the change. So again, this is, these are good changes. Moving to MDC5, which is our disorders of the circulatory system. And historically, every year, disorders of the circulatory system do uh, have a lot of logic changes. They removed the procedure codes that are listed here that are for insertion of radioactive elements from DRGs 246 and two, through 249, that whole range, 46, 47, 48, and 49. Um, and, but they left them in DRG 264 for other circulatory OR procedures. And the logic behind this is these are not procedures that are done for any type of, they're not a percutaneous cardiovascular procedure. They're not, they're not doing an angioplasty. They're not doing, they're just putting that radioactive element in that vessel and for treatment of uh, a cancer. So, um, versus treatment of some coronary artery disease. So that's the reasoning behind why they made that change. They also have revised the titles of DRG 246 and 248, and they revised them to state arteries versus vessels. And this was really to reflect ICD-10 terminology. Vessels was something that was left over from the ICD-9 days, and so it's, they just updated it to make sure that they said the arteries, because that's what they're doing here, these are arteries. So in MDC-5, we reassigned percutaneous mitral valve replacements. And there are four codes. Again, they're listed on page 37 of the PDF in the final rule. Or if you have the Federal Register, it's page 38026. And uh, they were moved from the valve and other major procedures without cath to endovascular cardiac valve. And that's really where they belong. They belong in the endovascular because that's what they're doing, they're percutaneous. Staying in MDC-5 again, we assigned eight new procedure codes from the uh, percutaneous and transapical, which I said incorrectly, transapical, percutaneous tricuspid valve replacement to DRGs 266 and 267. And again, this is uh, found on the same page, 37 of the PDF in the Federal Register. So you can read all about it and see exactly what those codes were. In MDC-5, they have uh, reclassified these codes listed that are revision of neurostimulator neurostimulator generators from OR procedures to non-OR procedures, and this impact in MDC-5 in DRGs 252, 253, and 254, because uh, now we are gonna be able to account for that subset of patients that are having a neurostimulator uh, inserted. So this, again, these are good things. I hate that I haven't been able to find a bad thing that they've done. I used 
to, I used to complain about the changes, but I really have to say my tax dollars are working well with CMS. They have a process in place that they use well and, and they give you all the explanation of why they made their changes. So that if you disagree, you can disagree and they listen to all disagreements. Um, we're moving now from MDC-5, the circulatory to MDC-8, musculoskeletal. And I think these are the two most changed MDCs always. Uh, this year, they reassigned ankle replacement procedures that are listed here from CRG 470 major joint without MCC to DRG 469 with MCC, even if the patient does not have an MCC. They're moving them there. So because of that, um, they're, they're changing the titles to um, include that total knee replacement. They changed the title so we could so we could see it in in DRG uh, 469. This is a nice um, bump in the weight. The weight for DRG. Um, 469 is 3.1954, and the weight in 470 is 2.0473. So that's a that's a nice bump in the weight with that change. If you, if you're doing ankle replacement in your facility, still staying in MDC eight, we're moving these procedure codes that are listed here that are for, for spinal fusions from the posterior spinal fusion list to the anterior spinal fusion list in the grouper logic for the DRGs that are listed here, 453, 454, 455. And they also are moving 149 procedures for spinal fusion from the posterior only to the anterior. And this you'll see is a new table I have listed here. It says table 6P.3A. This table can be found on the CMS website. And I have the CMS website links at the back of the presentation so that, uh, that you can get there and you can see the exact codes. Um, there was a whole lot of discussion in the Federal Register because of um, People were requesting changes for magnetic spinal repositioning, um, but they didn't make any changes to that. They, they made a lot of discussion. They didn't make any changes. These procedure codes that have been moved are seven of the new procedure codes that were just created for this year, the ones that are going from the posterior list to the anterior list. So these are new codes that you haven't had before. And you probably want to, if, you, if these are procedures that you do, you're going to want to see how this is going to impact you. In MDC 13, which is a female reproductive system, we reclassified the PCS code for repair of the hymen, external approach, from an OR status to a non-OR status. So this means that in MDC 13, if you have this procedure, it's no longer going to group to DRGs for 746 and 747, which are procedure DRG. And if you're in MDC 14, so if the patient is pregnant, um, then they are no longer going to group to DRG 987 and 989. And 987, 989, remember, these are at the, at the end because these are where the diagnoses and the procedure are unrelated. The principal diagnosis is unrelated to itself. So they'll be removed from there because this will no longer be considered a surgical procedure. Pardon me as I grab myself a little sip here. While we're in MDC 14 pregnancy, 
They removed 314 codes that were identified with the unspecified trimester. And from the invalid discharge diagnosis list. So they were removed from DRG 998 and they were reassigned to the DRGs in which their counterpart codes belong. So, for example, if you have code 010.119, which is pre existing hypertension complicating pregnancy. Um, and your sixth character does define the trimester, it says third trimester, then if you use the counterpart of that code that's unspecified trimester, it's going to go into the same DRG. So that's a whole lot of coding crapple type, type um, language. But what this means is previously, these if patients came in and, and had one of these diagnoses with an unspecified trimester, they weren't classified in the, into the DRGs of delivery. And now they will be. Now they're going to be classified. And what CMS has said is the fact that the trimester is not specified does not preclude the significance of these conditions, nor the resources involved in caring for the patients with these conditions. So while we encourage providers to focus efforts on improving their respective documentation, we also believe that the DRG assignment should appropriately reflect the resources. So again, again this is a, a place where we're stepping back from that hard line of we can't use unspecified. Because in reality, we all know that sometimes that that's as good as you get. You have to use unspecified. Staying in MDC 14 with the pregnancy, they removed the three codes that are listed here that describe supervision of pregnancy from DRG 782 antipartum diagnoses without medical complications to MSDRG 998 invalid as principal diagnoses. And if you want to think about it, these codes really are outpatient codes. This is supervision of a pregnancy. Somebody is not admitted just for supervision. There's a, there's a reason they're being supervised if they're in the hospital. Okay, we're moving right along here, still in MDC 14 with the pregnancy. Um, they removed the ICD diagnosis code for shock, it's 075.1, during or following delivery. They removed it from the list of principal or secondary diagnoses under the first condition of the grouper logic in MSDRG 774, which is a complicating delivery, 767, which is um, a vaginal delivery with sterilization, and 768, which is a vaginal delivery with operative procedure except for sterilization. So they moved it out of here, and this is one of those cases where they have a list of codes that say this code can be either the principal or the secondary, and you're going to go into these DRGs. So they took it out of there and they moved it to postpartum um, 769, postpartum and post-abortion, because it, and to 776. Because if you look at the code, it's shock following labor and delivery. So it doesn't really meet the requirement of being antipartum or during delivery. You've already delivered. So you're in the postpartum. So again, this is a change that was a logic change. It was something that had been misclassified all along. Moving from the moms to the babies, and now we're in MDC 15, they um, moved 14 codes from the Z05 category, which frankly is the whole Z05 category, which is observation of newborns for suspected conditions that are ruled out. They moved all of them out of the DRG 794 for other significant procedures to 795 for normal newborn. Now, this is a decrease in the weight for sure, because if it's a significant problem, you're getting a weight of 1.3425. And now as a normal baby, you're getting 
0.1818. That's a pretty big change. Um, but again, it's a logical change. They probably most shouldn't have been there in the first one. Okay, we're moving to MDC 17. And this is where we have myeloproliferative disorders and poorly differentiated neoplasms. And the titles were changed in the three DRGs that are listed here from lymphoma boba with OR procedure to just other procedure. They took the OR out. Um, and the reason that they did this is because they have, and I think it's on the next slide, they've reassigned, that's not in, that's not on the next slide. It's in my brain here. Um, they, the reason that they did this is because they reviewed the list of OR versus non-OR codes, which is part of their annual code changes. And um, they determined that 55 of those codes were not ORs, that they really didn't warrant being uh, designated as a non-OR that affect these DRGs. And so they changed the title and they left the codes here, but they changed the title because they've, they've downgraded the codes. They're no longer impacting the DRG. So that was 55 procedure codes that were downgraded. Moving to MDC 21, this is our poisonings. Um, this is again a request from uh, someone outside of CMS to review the codes in category T85.8, which are other specified complications of internal prosthetic devices with the seventh character of A for initial uh, encounter. And what the person who made the request said, it was the A and the D that they wanted CMS to review because they felt they were being classified in the wrong DRG. So um, when CMS made their review, they did say, whoa, whoa, if we're in the initial encounter, why are we in an aftercare DRG? So they did move them out, but as, as I've said, CMS has a good process in place when they do these reviews. So they um, moved both the A and the D, and they also moved the S for the sequela. And, um, oops, and I'm sorry, here's a typo here. Sorry, right here, this should be separated. Um, they moved the sequela from the aftercare with the CC and MCC to the injury and poisoning DRGs because they felt that it was more resource intensive and as a result of their analysis. So if you ask them partial questions, they're gonna come back and they're gonna do a full check. Meg, do we have any questions outstanding that need to be addressed before I move on? Um, we just have one question about the long-term care. I don't know if you want to answer it now or send it uh, or save it for the end. It was a pretty yeah, simple question. Let's save it question. for the end. Oh, okay. okay. Go ahead. Um, just okay. wondering if the hatch, hack logic applies to the long-term care hospitals. Oh, that's a great question. No, it does not. It only applies okay. to short-term acute care. So Great, it does thank not you. Apply to the long term care, which also means it does not apply to critical access. But that's because critical access is not reimbursed under DRGs either yet. Um, but it's short term acute care hospitals only that the POA and HAC logic apply. Now, POA, some state data reporting require you to report POA, it just doesn't impact your reimbursement. Good question. That was a good question. Yeah, great question. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, let's look at what other annual changes are done every year. Every year, CMS looks at the Medicare code editor, and they check all the codes in all the lists to make sure that things are where they should be. And this year, they removed L21.0 from pediatric age edit um, because they felt that it's not limited to 
pediatric age. Um, the maternal age of it, there were a ton of changes made, both additions and uh, deletions to the maternal age of it. And again, this can be found on table 60.1a, and I'll give you the link at the end of the presentation so that you can go get all those uh, codes if you uh, are concerned about it. The sex edits, and you know, these are the edits for diagnoses and procedures that you can't have a pregnant man, you can't have a woman with a prostate procedure, that kind of stuff. Um, and they did add some codes here and they did remove a code from males only edit. And um, it did add a uh, code to the list of diagnoses for females only. This is just a snippet, and please go to the table to see the full list. In the non-covered procedures, we talked about some of those non-covered procedures already, um, but they uh, did remove codes from that list. And the unacceptable principal diagnoses, they added a code for exercise counseling. Again, that's something that you shouldn't be in the hospital for, so how can we have a problem with it? And some of the new ICD-10 SAM codes were also added, and these are codes that deal with our dental care. Again, eh, hardly a reason to be admitted to the hospital. Can't find fault with them making that kind of a change. CMS also every year reviews this whole list of DRGs that I have up here. And these are the DRGs where the procedure is unrelated to principal diagnosis. You know, it's like the James Bond, the collar and the cuffs don't match. Um, and they reassign codes, move them around from one to the other usually. The changes that were made this year, uh, they reassigned the prostate OR procedure code from DRG 984, 985, and 986 to the DRGs 987 through 989. So you can see that the 984, et cetera, those were specific to prostate OR unrelated to principal diagnosis. And I can remember when they created those DRGs. And now they not only have reassigned them, they've deleted. Those are the three DRGs that have been deleted. And in their analysis, they discovered that they didn't really um, require are there on special separate DRGs anymore? Medicine has changed, the way we treat things have changed, and the DRGs have to keep up with it because after all, eh, there's where we're getting our monies and our reimbursement. Here's a whole list of the rest of the review that is done by CMS on the um, uh, codes, and it's the MCC list, they add, change, delete, the CC list. Uh, there were no changes to the principal diagnosis as its own MCC. And this was a unique situation for ICD-10. There never in ICD-9, principal diagnosis could never be its own MCC. It was, that just didn't happen. You can't, it's like you're double dipping. So you couldn't use it that way. When we moved to ICD-10 because of combination codes, everything's not separately coded anymore. Um, they had to create this new category to keep things within the same DRG that they were in with ICD-9. So we've had principal diagnosis as its own MCC and principal diagnosis as its own CC, and there were no changes to either of those this year. Uh, there were changes to the secondary diagnosis on the CC exclusion list. And remember what this is. This is, yes, the code is a CC, but if it's a secondary diagnosis with a certain principal diagnosis, it's not considered a CC because it's considered to be too closely related to that principal diagnosis. So it doesn't count as a CC. Um, in the groupers, you'll still see a CC next to the code, but you'll be in a DRG that doesn't have a CC. And it's because, yeah, it still is, it just didn't count. Um, and that's, you can see that's the principal diagnosis additions to the CC exclusion list, secondary deletions and principal diagnosis deletes. And we've given you all the tables. And again, I told you, I'm going to give you the 
link to get to those tables at the very end of the uh, of the presentation. Okay, surgical hierarchy. Let's just talk about what surgical hierarchy means. Um, this means that if a patient has multiple procedures that could be assigned to different DRGs based on the procedure, that which one takes priority? Which which procedure is going to take priority. So, so in this case, DRG 614 and 615 for adrenal and pituitary procedures is now sequenced above DRG 622, 23, and 24 for skin grafts and the Brigman within MDC 10. So the way this came to be is because there was a, a, a requester who said, that they had a patient who had a um, pituitary gland excised, and they during the procedure they also had a harvest of a fat graft to use, you know, as as part of the whole procedure. And the fat graft took priority, and the patient was classified into the skin graft DRG. So CMS took a look, and they said, "Yikes!" And they flopped them around, and um, this, that's how, so that's how the surgical hierarchy works. This was the only change to the surgical hierarchy this year. The new tech add-on payment. So what this is, is these are the devices and the pharmaceutical companies go to CMS and they say, we have this wonderful brand new mousetrap. Nobody else has one like it. We want you to give us codes and we want you to make sure you pay us for our new wonderful device that we have. The CMS has created an add-on payment system for this new technology. And there's three requirements, three criteria must be met. The first one is it must be new. It can't be something that was, you know, 10 years ago and you know, drag it out of the out of the cedar chest. It has to be something new. It must be something that's costly, that the DRG rate otherwise is inadequate. So the DRG rate doesn't cover the cost of whatever the add-on technology is. And it must be a substantial clinical improvement over existing services or technology. And because this is Medicare, um, as in all things Medicare, it has to be quality care for the elderly population. It, that has to be, of course, a major part of um, anything that we do with the Medicare. So these three criteria must be met. We have newly approved um, new tech for, for fiscal year 2018. And I'm not even going to try to even pretend that I'm going to try to say that because I'm not. But Zimplava is um, apparently the uh, copyrighted name. And it's identified, here's another typo here, this should be identified, not identified, with the codes that I've listed here. And it's, as you can see, they're really nice codes. Um, they specifically point out exactly what you're doing. They name the, the drug that's uh, being uh, given to the patient. And what this is, is a, um, a drug to help reduce the um, recurrence of C. diff infection. And C. diff, as we all know, people are given antibiotic drug treatments, and they add this drug to help prevent that C. diff uh, from recurring. Now with the new C. diff recurring code, we'll be able to keep track and see how effective this bugger is too, won't we? We'll be able to see, hey, a patient had this, let's check. The maximum add-on add -on for this drug is uh, $1,900. Okay, I see we're coming down the line here. Uh, new tech, new, we have uh, a uh, aortic valve that's new. Two companies applied for new tech add-on for, for this uh, new valve. Um, because both are identified with the same PCS code, they couldn't give it to one and not the other one. And the maximum add on here is the $6,110.23.
we have a uh, another new drug that um, has its own um, code assigned to it, nice code, and the maximum add-on for that is $2,400. And this is IV infusion treatment for Crohn's disease. Is what is what the Solera is. All right. The next slide are things that have already been being paid new tech, and they are still approved. So I'm just going to skip over it because we are timing down short of time. Uh, I've given you the code, though, and the reimbursement amount for the, the new tech. And this is a list of those things that were being paid add-on, but they're no longer eligible on payments. This should be. Uh, 218. Fat fingers cause you to have typos in the presentation. And I'll point them out to you. Okay, as promised, here's the website. Um, you're able to download a copy of these um, slides, and that way you'll be able to, uh, you know, maybe launch it from within or, or copy and paste it. The first one is CMS site for the inpatient PPS final rule, and this is where you're going to find all of the code lists that we were talking about. There's going to be all the codes, all the, they, they have all the tables, they're all listed there for you, and uh, feel free, go take them and find them and love them. The second one here is uh, for the um, CMS website for the Coordination and Maintenance Committee meeting. And I know it still says ICD-9, but it really is ICD-10 meetings. And the last one is the coordination and maintenance from the CDC. And remember I told you uh, National Center is responsible for the CM portion and CMS is responsible for the um, CCS portion. And they're meeting today and tomorrow, so whatever they see this year, we'll probably be seeing new codes for it next year. And finally, the last one here, this is the DRG definition manual. And this is where you're going to find all the lists of the comorbid conditions, the principal as a CC, the exclusion list. These are all in the appendix, but it's the full definition manual. And I want you to know this is a wonderful reference, wonderful resource for you, because when things group on and you're like, why did it go there? You'll be able to come here and figure it out. Meg, I realize we're really short, but do we have any questions? Uh, we just had one question, which was actually a really interesting question. Um, and it, the question is, the new technology add-on payment, also what used to be called pass-through payment, are those terms interchangeable? Um, no. The new technology is only one part of the pass-through payments. Pass-through payments have other things that are included in there, and some of them are, and I'm making some of this up, but like the low-volume hospital additional payments, that kind of stuff. So when you see pass-through payments, and to be honest with you, CMS has never fully defined everything that's in pass-through payments, but it's not part of, if you use the CMS pricer online, pass-through payments aren't listed there. It's not part of the DRG reimbursement. They're like done after the fact and outside of the grouper. Great. So that Thank is a you. good question. That's a great yeah. question. Thank you. Is that the last, that's the only question? Um, we do have a couple more questions, but I know we're at 301, so I don't know if you want to keep going. No, that's okay. We will get back to the folks who have questions um, after okay. the presentation. I great. Um, thank you for attending today. I did just want to point out we have two upcoming webinars. November 8th, Nancy Herschel is doing Bridging the Gap Between Coding and Revenue Integrity. And December the 6th, our own Karen Scott is doing Addressing CPT Coding Challenge. But thank you everyone for attending. I'm sorry we went over a minute. See you next time.